If you've been around this channel for a little while, you'll know that I'm a big fan of netbooks. And while I got lots of use out of my original Triple E PC, eventually I was on the lookout for something shiny and new, and the Acer Spire one was what came next. And shiny is definitely the operative word here, because the entire top shell on this thing is a veritable fingerprint magnet. Yes, even the LCD they used is glossy and reflective, which is generally not my first choice when I select a laptop. But I fell in love with the rich blue color of the Aspire 1, as blue has been my favorite color for as long as I can remember. And while it's barely bigger than my original Triple E PC, it manages to one-up it in almost every sense. The Aspire 1 model A150 sports a dual-core Intel Atom N270 processor clocked at 1.6GHz. For storage, it has a 160GB 5400RPM drive, and it's paired with 1GB of RAM. The display is an 8.9-inch panel running at a resolution of 1024 by 600 and it ends up being a lot more serviceable than the 800 by 480 offered by the original Triple E PC. The left side of the machine houses the DC jack as well as a VGA out, Ethernet, USB port, and an SD card reader. The right side has a headphone jack and microphone jack, as well as two more USB ports and another SD card reader. Now, this unit is one that I picked up recently off of eBay with a non-functional battery, as I used my original Aspire one until its motherboard died and I wasn't able to salvage it. I ordered a replacement battery at the same time, but unfortunately, it turns out that the battery wasn't the problem. Instead, the machine itself isn't able to charge the battery. So while it would run off of the residual charge from the battery when I first got it, once that was used up, its portable days were at an end. Still, I can't wait to get this thing fired up and see if it's as much fun as I remember. The keyboard is definitely on the small side, but it's not too difficult to type proficiently on. A little cramped, but not too bad. The touchpad, on the other hand, is easily my least favorite touchpad on all mobile devices. Having the buttons located on the side of the touchpad instead of underneath it is just awkward, and I end up relying on tapping or just using an external mouse. But before we get into testing out some software and games, I thought we should start off by maxing out the RAM. Now, here's one place where the Triple E PC wins. Ease of upgrade. Instead of accessing the RAM through the store, we get access to an unpopulated mini PCIe socket. Just what I needed. So to get to the RAM, all we have to do is disassemble the entire lower half of this machine, including removing the motherboard. The keyboard lifts out by pressing some tabs at the top of the keyboard and then prying the keyboard up. From there, remove all the visible screws, and then flip the unit over and remove the screws there as well. And don't forget the hidden ones underneath the feet on the bottom of the unit. With that done, and all the ribbon cables disconnected, you lift the motherboard out with the hard drive still attached to it. And there's the RAM. The machine has 512 megs of RAM built onto the motherboard and a slot that can accept an additional 1 gig, giving us 1.5 total. I wasn't originally planning to replace the hard drive, but since you have to do a full disassembly to get to it, I might as well add this SSD at the same time. Now, I wanted to preserve the original software, so I used a hard drive cloning utility and cloned the data from the original drive to the new SSD. Next, it was time to install the SSD and put it all back together. Unfortunately, when I got it to this point, it wouldn't turn on. So I popped the cover off and found that, sure enough, the cable that goes from the motherboard to the daughterboard that has the power switch on it was partially disconnected. With the cable fixed and the machine back together, it was time to test the boot up speed with the new SSD. Now the one step you didn't see was me test booting the Aspire 1 with the original drive back in so I could compare the differences between the SSD and the original drive. The original drive is on the left and the SSD is on the right. 
I synced up the video based on the first frame of the video that has the LCD lit up, and I stopped it at the point that the Steam pop-up shows up saying that Windows XP is no longer supported. And it looks like the difference is about 7 seconds. Not bad. Next, I wanted to compare gaming performance between the Triple E PC and the Aspire 1, so I installed 3D Mark 2001 on both machines. The Triple E PC was up first and it turned in a score of 1752. The Aspire 1 came in at just over 60% faster at a respectable 2904. So we should see a wider variety of games that are able to run on it. Now, Windows XP stopped receiving updates a long time ago, and the major browsers don't support it anymore either. I installed the latest version of Firefox that'll run on it, and even for basic browsing, it's just way too slow. Even basic browsing on new sites was a multi-minute experience, so you're definitely not going to use this as your daily driver. I got surprisingly watchable playback from YouTube, but the video was limited to 360p, and it took over two minutes to get to a video from the time that I typed in the URL. So, unless you're really patient, this machine isn't likely going to cut it for you. I also tried some locally stored 1080p content as well, but while the audio would play, I couldn't get any video to display. It is possible that the machine just can't keep up with it at all, but it may also be related to some DirectX problems I ran into later on. More on that later. Moving into games, I started off with Star Trek Elite Force. And the Aspire One delivered a smooth, quick experience all the way through. With the addition of the SSD, load times are very snappy, and the frame rates usually stayed well above 30. Of course, even though this is an Intel integrated graphics chipset, it's still at least 5 years newer than the game, so it would be pretty disappointing if it didn't keep up. Likewise, Unreal Tournament plays very well here. Okay, sure, the keyboard is a little cramped, and you definitely need to stick to using an external mouse, but for something that you can just tuck about anywhere and bring with you, it's a fantastic little gaming experience. Now, for something a little more advanced, I turn to Need for Speed Underground 2. And here we begin to hit the upper limit of what most would consider playable. Very low double digit frame rates, occasionally dipping into the single digits, are all it can muster even with the graphics turned all the way down. And while admittedly I did play this game on my original Aspire 1 back in the day, it's just not very impressive by today's standards. Luckily, older entries in the Need for Speed franchise are more content with the minuscule graphics offerings from the Aspire 1, such as Need for Speed Porsche Unleashed. Even at default settings, while not delivering mind-blowing frame rates, it ends up being a lot more playable than Need for Speed Underground 2 was. The Sims, while not being anything to write home about, is still a fantastic game to run on the Aspire 1. Since the action is a little slower paced to begin with, it really isn't hurt by the lower frame count too much. I also wanted to see how this machine would work as an emulation system. Its small but clear screen, coupled with a decent amount of storage, seemed like it could make a nice little portable arcade unit. And while older systems like the NES or SNES played just as well as you would expect, I had a harder and harder time finding newer system emulation that would support Windows XP. And for the ones that I did find and that would run, they complained about missing DirectX 9 files. At this point, I decided to do a full system restore, thinking that I might have inadvertently screwed something up. But, even on a fresh restore, I still ran into the missing files, even though DirectX 9C came pre-installed. I haven't looked too far into this yet, but my first guess is that the version of Windows XP that comes pre-installed, which is Ultra Mobile PC Edition, might have had limited DirectX support, as I know the Intel GMA 950 does support DirectX 9. Acer really seems to have listened to the biggest complaints related to the original Triple E PC and have addressed them. A larger screen and keyboard, a faster processor, and literally 80 times the amount of storage all improve the user's experience. But its biggest limitation for modern use is definitely the operating system. So I look forward to revisiting the Aspire 1 again in the future and trying to find the right balance between performance and an updated OS. And if that's something you'd like to see, Make sure to like this video and subscribe for future updates. And while you're at it, feel free to comment below and let me know what operating systems you'd like to see tested. Thanks for checking out this look back at the Acer Aspire 1. And thanks to all my Patreon supporters on the screen right now who help make videos like this one possible. That's it for this one, but I'll see you again soon.